I've said in the last couple of weeks leading up to tonight that Ash Wednesday is a very powerful service. It's a very powerful night. I've called this service a very moving service, and it is. Tonight is a very honest night, and I know that I've said it before, but it bears repeating. There is no one who will be quite as honest with you as the church is tonight. Ash Wednesday is not a religious observance that's noted in the Bible. Jesus never spoke of it. The early disciples in the book of Acts didn't either. But for centuries, the church has remembered this day as the start of Lent, which has been a season that tends to be more introspective and feels more somber and sometimes individual in nature. Lent tends to be a season where we focus on confession and forgiveness It's the season that challenges us to give up something so that we can somehow draw closer to God. Perhaps that's our modern uh, modern version of fasting, where we give up chocolate or caffeine or soda or sweets or cursing or being mean to other people or wine or insert whatever else you might be giving up here so that we can be reminded of God's presence with us and when we can't, when we miss the thing that we now can't have. Tonight we start that season, and it becomes real for us all too fast. We start off reading the words of Psalm 51, which is a psalm of confession to God. Then we hear these readings of Scripture, and in a minute we'll be invited into the disciplines of Lent, and we'll make an extended confession of the ways in which we individually and corporately have messed up or fallen short of God's intention for us. But then we receive the imposition of ashes, and we hear the words, Remember you were dust, and to dust you shall return. Those are hard-hitting words. Ash Wednesday reminds us chiefly of our mortality, and that's not something we usually wish to face. This night, as we begin our Lenten journey or our pilgrimage, We're reminded of what a friend and mentor of mine calls a royal slap in the face, an honest confrontation with the truth, the hardest yet most gracious news you will ever experience. Tonight, the church remembers on Ash Wednesday that our mortality is the great equalizer. We're all created beings, we're all dust people, and tonight we stand before God at our core remembering how much We are in need and long for something more than we can see or hear in the news, more than the temporary things where moth and rust consume, more than the broken, hot messes we are. Tonight, on Ash Wednesday, what we're doing is admitting that we can't do life on our own. We're admitting that we long for that something that is more than us, that something that is God. We long to be where God is. We long for the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what Jesus gives us tonight. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus continues his Sermon on the Mount, which we've been exploring for about the last, we're going to say, four or five weeks. And Jesus is still talking about the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, and that means a place where dignity is upheld and reconciliation is practiced. Tonight we hear Jesus talking about giving alms and praying and fasting, all of which are chief disciplines of Lent. But Jesus warns us about our motivation in the midst of all these things. Beware, he says, of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. I've always been taken aback a little bit by that on Ash Wednesday. In fact, most of the time, I'd rather not preach on this reading from Matthew because we hear Jesus say this and then we get marked with ashes and we go out into the world for others to see. But this week, I've come to take a little comfort in the fact that the Greek word that is translated as piety really has a sense of justice. Beware of practicing your justice before others in order that you may be seen by them. Jesus is going back to what we heard a couple of weeks ago in the Beatitudes. We heard that blessed are all the people who are not powerful or good or have the mask of perfection on their faces. 
Jesus is really asking us what our motivation for doing these pious or justice-oriented things is. Is it to be noticed by others? Well, then that might not be faithful to the larger commitment to justice that Jesus has already set up in chapter 5. So why do we do what we do? Why do we fast? Why do we give things up for Lent? Why do we pray? Why do we give money to the poor? Is it to be noticed or publicly recognized or to to get some badge of honor somehow? That's what people in Jesus' day would have been concerned about. But we should note that nowhere does it say in this reading that it's bad to be seen. Rather, Jesus says that God is not impressed by outward showiness because God even sees the secret places of our hearts. There's no question about whether we should do these works of justice. That's a given, and Jesus has said as much in all of this leading up to this section. The focus here tonight is on our motivation. Some folks have talked about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount as Jesus' I have a dream speech. And ultimately, Jesus' dream, God's dream, is for the world to be just and equitable and where all people matter, even the misfits. The key question with our reading tonight is, how do we participate in bringing the justice and God's dream about in this here and now, even in the midst of our brokenness and even in the midst of our need for forgiveness? We participate in God's justice as we pray and as we fast and as we give alms, because behind that is a longing on our part for the righteousness and justice that Jesus talks about, and to see God's intentions brought to light and made public right here where we are and where we go. Now that sounds so good, and maybe it gives us warm and fuzzy feelings, but, but there is a danger in this thing that we call justice. The danger is the assumption that we know what that justice is and that it looks like my own political or personal views and as long as you agree with me, then we've got justice. But maybe Jesus is also challenging us to something different. Maybe Jesus is challenging us to enlarge our vision of justice and to realize that even people who are different from us can help teach us about a communal view of justice. A justice that is bigger than me, bigger than you. A justice that can only make sense as we discover it in community. Therein lies the promise of these words of Jesus tonight. We don't do this or this whole Lenten season or pilgrimage on our own. We do it in community with other people. Justice, and maybe we can define justice as as what God's intentions are for the world. Justice does not come out of common sense. The truth of Ash Wednesday tells us that we are sin-filled and sin separates us both from God and from each other. That means that we don't have it in us on our own to do justice. Justice has to be studied, and to do that we have to get outside of ourselves and our circles that we run in and listen to the other or to the neighbor. It's about relationship, and only together can we discover God's justice for the world. As our pilgrimage continues through this season of Lent, we'll find that everything we hear from Jesus is meant to form us into a community of people who take seriously each other, but also a community of people who keep our eyes focused on God. Together, we are in our rooms, praying to God for God's justice, mercy, and love to come to us, our neighbors, and our world. What I hope we find in this pilgrimage and this season is that God doesn't disappoint. God's blessings on your way. Amen.